you will need your Bibles tonight. So as you ready your Bibles, I want to start with some false facts we thought were true. A drop coin from a tall building will kill someone. This has been, this has been debunked. I used to have a fear of this, that when I grew up in Sydney, that I would walk you know, underneath the center point tower and some guy would drop a coin, uh, ten, you know, maybe a 10 cent coin that would land on my head and kill me. But this is a false fact we thought were true, but it's not. Another false fact that we thought was true, that the Bible clearly states that there are three wise men. The Bible, whoa, we good? The Bible tells us that there were three gifts and there were wise men, but it doesn't clearly state that there was three wise men. So false facts we thought were true. Have you ever heard that quote that goes, blind lies a bat? We thought that bats were blind, but bats can see, but they travel with this amazing radar system that God created in them. We were told that these facts were that bulls hated the color red, which is what angered them, and they would chase after the bullfighter, but bulls are colorblind. They can't actually see the color red, but it's the waving of the flag of the bullfighter uh, that causes the bull to rage up and chase him. You know, when we get to the narrative of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's very important for us to understand what the gospel of Jesus is because the gospel we teach determines the disciples we make. And so it's very important for us to get this right. And so the narrative of scripture is that earth is created and God creates the earth. And there's a time span when you come into existence. But it leads you to two destinations, whether you're gonna end up in heaven or whether you're gonna end up in hell. Then you've got um, us, we come into existence. There's you and there's I, and we break into human history at some point. And then what we learn and what's been taught to us is that there's two destinations that awaits us in the future, and that is heaven or hell. I should clear up hell because in Christianity, the popular thought about hell, because the text of Revelation reads that it's a place of eternal torment, where people are in this eternal flame and they're constantly in that torment for the rest of eternity. I want you to know that as an Adventist Christian, we do not subscribe to that idea of hell. What we believe is there's eternal life and there's eternal death. We believe that death will be instant and death is asleep. And the reason why we believe this is when you look at Scripture systematically, you, can, you want to put up against the idea of hell, of this eternal torment against the character of God. And when you put the character of God that's loving and gracious and compassion against this popular idea of hell for eternal torment, it just doesn't sit right. And so I subscribe to the idea and the theology of the Adventist church when it comes to hell. So when you hear me refer to hell, he, please hear me that I'm coming from the perspective of the Adventist church. Now you're going to see that there will be some blue lines up on the screen, which just kind of informs us that life is difficult, that we're going to go through some challenges in life. Life is not all rosy, but you and I are here. And so this idea is that there's earth that's created, you and I come in, life is challenging, and based on the way that we behave and based on what we do, based on what we believe, we're either going to end up, because of God's decision, we're going to end up at heaven or we're gonna end up in hell. I know the picture says that the girls are going to heaven and the boys are going to hell. I'm not a graphic designer, I did my best on canva.com. Right? And so the boys, we love barbecue, so we're going to hell, we know that. I'm joking. But this is the narrative of the Bible. Or is it? Because the majority of non-Christians who have some sort of idea or concept of God, believe that Christians believe this, that this is the narrative that we believe as Christians. But the scary thing is, is that the majority of you that are Christians that are here or in Ella or watching online, you believe this narrative about the gospel as well. 
the only problem that we have about this narrative about the gospel of Jesus, the greatest enemy to this narrative is the word of God itself. And so we're gonna need our Bible. So let's go to the word of God. Come with me to the gospel of Mark. And we're gonna look at gospel of Mark chapter one. And we're gonna look at what Jesus teaches about his gospel. We're gonna let him speak. So let's come to the gospel of Mark chapter one. And we're gonna read today and know what the gospel of Jesus that he preached. If you're there at Mark one, let me know, but just give me a mm mm-hmm. Okay, follow along as I read. Here we go. Verse one. This is the good news. Now, if you're not familiar with Christianity, the good news is interchangeable with the gospel. The gospel is just an announcement. So whenever you hear good news or gospel, somebody is making an announcement, okay? So the good news is about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So this tells us some things. This tells us that the announcement of the good news is about Jesus. He's the center of this gospel. We also read from this text that Jesus is this Messiah, and this has some rich Old Testament in it because it's deeply found in the Old Testament that there will be this promised Messiah, and this is Jesus. We also read that Jesus is not only the Messiah, but he is also the Son of God. And so let's look at verses two and three. We'll probably read about hell in there, right? We should read about hell because of the narrative that we believe. Let's read verses two and three. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written, look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you and he will prepare your way. Talking about John the Baptist. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord's coming, clear the road for him. There's nothing about hell in there, And there's good reason for it, and I'll explain why. Somewhere down south of Sydney, there's a place called Jamboree. It's a theme park. And my family used to always book it. Uh, At the beginning of the year, we would all go there. There's about 80 of us that would go, and we would hang out. My mom would book out a couple of um, um, huts so that we can leave our stuff, and we can go and enjoy the theme park and hang out at Jamboree. And there's this ride at Jamboree called the Rapid River. And it amazes me because it's like this big whirlpool. Right, that's automatic. It's designed to be a whirlpool. And it's got different entry points that you can jump in, whether with your raft or whether with a donut, and it just automatically floats you right around. It's just amazing. It's even more amazing when you see the size of the Samoans that are on there and, <laughs> and it continues to float us all around this whirlpool. Like, that's a miracle. It's just amazing. And so... The thing about this text in verses two and three is that Jesus is not a new narrative. It's not a new beginning. The narrative, the announcement of Jesus is here is part of a rich history of centuries that you can read in the Old Testament. It's like entering into this whirlpool of a big narrative that God has been playing all throughout history. And so now we wanna see what the gospel is. So come down to verse 14 and 15. 14 says this, later on, After John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news, the gospel. Verse 15, here we go. The time promised by God has come at last. He announced the kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. And believe the good news. Follow me now. What Jesus has just said, he has just announced the gospel. When he says, and believe the good news, he has already told us what that good news is. It's right there in that text. Did you see it? You see, the good news was something that had just arrived. It was something that had just come onto the scene, which was the kingdom of God. So you see, the gospel isn't some distant or future place that we're gonna end up in, some destination like heaven or hell. The gospel is the good news that God has come to us. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the first gospel, the narrative that's false facts, puts you and I at the center of that gospel, that you and I could actually make decisions that's gonna determine whether or not we go to heaven or we go to hell. It's a you-centric, me-centric gospel. 
But the gospel of Jesus Christ isn't a place that we're going to go to, but it's an announcement that God has come to us. He has invaded earth. And when he invades earth, it's for a purpose. So Jesus makes this announcement. This is also the announcement of the rule and the reign of God. Now, when you hear that, it doesn't really mean too much to us in 2020, but this is what it means. It's kind of like Jesus is like the Godfather, and he's like, hey, Tony, you tell that devil, the devil that's got the authority that he took from Adam and Eve, you tell him, you tell him, I'm here. Tell everybody at Staten Island that Tony is here. It's done. But we don't read it like that. Because it's just a bunch of words for us in the Western world on, on the Bible. But these words were some fighting words from Jesus. That he was here to announce that the rule and the reign of God had come. Come for you and come for me. You see, the gospel is about God and what he's doing in our world. The gospel is about how God is going to behave in and through Jesus. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when, when we... Um, understand this gospel, then we understand what happened with heaven and earth. And so what took place was heaven and earth was this beautiful presence in Eden. And so what happened was the first image bearers would wake up and they would be in the presence of God. Wouldn't that be amazing to just wake up in Kurumbong and be in the presence of God? Right, this was Eden. And when they went for a walk, they were in the presence of God. When they talked, they were in the presence of God. When they ate, they were in the presence of God. This was Eden. And so something took place that separated heaven and earth. And so when the, what, what took place, it wasn't God's fault because God empowered the first image bearers to, to, to have authority in God. Now, I'm just making this number up, but let's just say there's 100,000 trees in the Garden of Eden. God says, see these 100,000 uh, 100, trees? You can eat from all of them except one. What a good God. But our first image bearers, they ate from that one tree that was the knowledge of good and evil. And so something inside of them died. So it wasn't that God created this world and something was wrong in the way that God set it up. Something went wrong with us in that we didn't trust God to define what good and evil was. And so we chose to be independent and define good and evil for ourselves. And so when the first image bearers did that, what they did is they brought sin into this world. And with that big power, they brought another power called death into this world. And so now earth was kind of separated from heaven, never to be God's plan. But the question that a lot of us ask is, but what about hell? What about all this evil that we see in the world? And, you know, if God is really a God of love, why should I follow your God when I see all this evil? You know, when you go to the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1, you read that the text says that God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You don't read about he created hell. It does, it's nowhere in the text. He created the heavens and the earth. Well, then how did hell come? Well, hell came when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. When they chose to be independent of God's wisdom and counsel, then that's what brought hell into existence. But hell is a sensitive topic because the reason why God has come to us, and that's good news, is because God wants hell out of his earth and out of his creation, and he wants it gone because he can't stand it. James, on the other hand, he's the brother of Jesus. He's the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He's the authority in Jerusalem. And James writes these words in chapter three of his letter, verses three to six. And it's got some huge implications for us today. Check this out. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn, or turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a forest on fire. Verse six, and among all parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire, 
It is a whole word of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by, by what? By hell. Mm -hmm. Your tongue can set fires for hell. And I know you're looking at me and going, what the hell are you talking about, preacher? I'm godly. Whatever. <laughs> Let me tell you what James is saying. James is saying that the tongue that we have in our mouths can do good and it can do evil. It can bring heaven on earth, but it can also bring hell on earth. But more deeper to this is a huge implication of this text. The implication of this text is telling us that hell is not a future reality, but hell is a present reality in and through your actions. Doesn't that just sting a little bit? That in our, in our hands is the ability to bring heaven or to bring hell on earth. And so this is the reason why God hates hell. Because his image bearers, which is us, the people made in his image and in his likeness, we unleash hell to each other each and every day. Every time you cheat on a girlfriend, you unleashed hell. Every time you cheat on your boyfriend, you unleash hell. Every time that you speak gossip to some, about somebody else that's untrue, you've unleashed hell. Every time the Holy Spirit is prompting you to sacrificially give and you refuse, you've unleashed hell. The child abuse that's happening in our world today is unleashing hell. Sex trafficking that's happening in our world is unleashing hell. God is not unleashing hell. It is his image bearers that choose to unleash hell on each other. And the heart of God is broken by his image bearers that unleash hell to one another. And so when he announces that the rule and reign of God has come, what God was saying was, here's the example through my son, on how you can live a hell-free life. And so all throughout the gospel of Mark or the gospel of Matthew or Luke or John, you read about how Jesus is constantly fighting against hell. He fights the effects of hell. He fights against death, diseases, blindness. He fights against the effects of hell. He fights against, you know, the, the, the religious system that just looks to imprison people with rules and rules and more rules. He fights against that because that was bringing hell in people's present reality. And he fights it so much that he lives this hell-free life that it angered the church of his day. And you know what they did with him? They decided to kill him. But Jesus allowed them to have their anger. And he allowed them to put him on a cross because his purpose was to come and to consume all the hell that mankind had to offer. And so there he is on a cross and he's consuming the hell because he wants to get hell out of earth and out of his creation. He can't stand it. He hates it. He detests it. But the gospel of Jesus is a double-edged sword. And here's how it is. Because when the good news is announced that God has now come, we sit there and we're like, yes, the gospel of Jesus, amen. But God's best strategy to get hell out of his earth and his creation in the present time is to get hell out of you. That's his best strategy. And so he sends his son to die on the cross so that you and I can have the opportunity to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ so that in that we can be gifted with the Holy Spirit that would live with the same power of hell that's in us. So now you've got the two powers. It's the, it's the, it's the internal conflict in Romans 7. So you can choose to bring heaven in people's present reality or you can choose to bring hell in people's present reality. And the one that's gonna characterize your life the most is the one that you feed. If you're, if you're playing around with worldly things and worldly influences, if that's the greatest thing that's more prominent in your life, then you will bring hell in people's present reality. But if you surround yourself with godly things, godly people, godly community, godly things, then you will characterize the things of God where you can act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God, be compassionate to people. When Jesus died on the cross, what he was doing was he was having the last say about the gospel. 
that hell would not have the last definitive say on the gospel. So when he died, that was Jesus, God's way of saying, we have the last say. We have the victory. And so when we look at the final book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, what we see in the book of Revelation in the last chapter, in the last page, what you're going to see is that hell ends up living outside the city. This city is what is called in the book of Revelation, the new city, the new heaven and the new earth. God is going to restore everything because that was his purpose of coming. But here's the reality of hell. It sits outside the new city, a city that's characterized with no more mourning, no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There's going to be no more hell in the city, but hell will live outside of the city. And here's the truth that's, that's very pointed. If you choose to live for Christ, if you choose to surrender your life to him, then you become an image bearer for him, with powered by the Holy Spirit. Then you get to spend eternity with him, and you get to live inside the city. But if you think that Christianity is just a bunch of, you know, nonsense and this and the prompting of the Holy Spirit to try to get you to see Jesus and to try to get you to, to surrender your life to Jesus and you keep turning that prompting away and then Jesus returns, then God will have to honor your decision and you'll stay outside of that new city. And it's not our desire here at Avondale College, Avondale College Church or the university campus to have any one of you be outside that city. We want you to be empowered by the Spirit and run to the raw so that you can choose to live godly, to have godly friends, godly influences, so that you can bring heaven on earth now. So people don't have to wait to get to heaven to experience heaven, but they can experience it now. And that's what God wants to put on your heart. So the question I have for you to wrap this up tonight is this. Which one characterizes your life right now in this moment in 2020? Is your life characterized by bringing more of hell in people's present? Or is your life characterized more of bringing heaven in people's present reality? Whichever one is gonna characterize you is the one that you're gonna feed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I see your heart break for the way that we unleash hell on each other. The way that we treat each other, the way that we are so unforgiving of each other, the way that we lack mercy, the way that we judge each other, the way that we are so selfish and the way that we abuse one another. All of that just hurts you and it breaks your heart. But thank you for your gospel that announced that you had arrived, to announce your rule and reign. Thank you that you have given us an example of how to live a hell-free life. May we have the courage of running to the raw and to live like Jesus so that we can bring heaven into people's reality so that they know that heaven is not a future reality, but it's a present one. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.